Please open your Bibles to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two. Lesson entitled, Heaven's Employee. Heaven's Employee. Before we begin, uh, before we read this passage rather, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the ministry system because it'll have something to do with, uh, with my lesson. Um, you know that I've mentioned in many other lessons and classes that the New Testament outlines five major areas of activities or ministry in the Christian church. In other words, if you're looking for what to do, what kind of ministry to do, the New Testament, especially the book of Acts, actually describes five different ministries for the church. They're not six or seven, they're not two or three, they're only five. And they're the following, and I think you're familiar with them. That's the system that we use here at Choctaw. The first, of course, is evangelism, the ministry of evangelism. And the ministry of evangelism is simply proclaiming the gospel to unbelievers, to the lost. Okay? Uh, the story of the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ, the meaning of His cross, getting that message outside of the building, getting it to other individuals in the community. And of course, this is done in a variety of ways by different people in the church, but the objective is always the same, that those who have not yet done so, after they hear the gospel, they'll confess that they believe in Christ, they'll repent of their sins, they'll be baptized in Jesus' name, just as Cynthia, for example, we had an example of that this morning, a woman was baptized for the forgiveness of her sins and also to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the ministry of evangelism described in Acts chapter 2, 237 all the way down to 241. The next area of ministry is education. Teaching the church the words of Jesus. Actually, teaching the church to obey the words of Jesus. Again, in a variety of ways, we try to teach people to understand and to put into practice God's word, which is the Bible. We teach little, very young children and you know, cradle row, or we teach them in a variety of ways when they're very young. We have adult classes, teen classes, but the objective is always the same, to teach the church to obey the words of Christ and how to put those words into effect into our lives. Third area of ministry mentioned in Acts chapter two is worship, the ongoing, uh, activity of worshiping God, the organization of public worship with the purpose of adoring our God. Of course, this also involves training people to uh, lead worship, uh, what Brother Bob was doing before, and Brother Hal did to uh, the public prayer, uh, the leading of songs, so on and so forth. That's the activity that the church um, assembles to do most often, right? We gather together as a church to offer worship to God. Well, that, that takes people to lead that, that takes people to organize that. That's the ministry of worship. Fourth area of, this, of ministry, the ministry of fellowship. Creating the opportunity and the environment where Christians can come together socially and also for the purpose of work and ministry so that they can encourage one another and build one another, uh, one another up in Christ. This is the ministry of fellowship, and it's carried out by those who organize events and projects that involve various individuals in the congregation. You know, the ladies that are organizing that game day for, well, it's a fellowship event. Yeah, it's about playing games and so on and so forth and enjoying the time together, but it's also a time where Christian women can come together and just enjoy each other's company uh, as, um, um, uh, believing, uh, as believing people. And so that's the area of fellowship. And then the last area is the ministry of service. And the ministry of service is so large that we actually break it down into three sub-ministries. One sub-ministry under service is the ministry of maintenance, which includes the care of the building and the grounds. Actually ask for volunteers in the area of service to go out and perhaps mow the lawn and to keep our property clean. Another area of the service ministry is administration. Administration involves the financial and the office, the communications, the employee operations, and so on and so forth. That's the administration side of the service ministry. And then there's one other area called benevolence. That's under service. Benevolence includes uh, the help that we offer our own congregation 
for food and other things, visiting the sick and counseling, all those areas where we're ministering to other individuals and helping them, ministry of benevolence, very active in this congregation. Now I mentioned all of these five ministries uh, because uh, that's the you know, that's the description of our overall work. I could spend an hour describing in detail each one, but you get the idea, these five areas of ministry. They're all described in Acts chapter two, but there are examples of these ministries being carried out all the way throughout the New Testament. Now, I entitled this sermon, Heaven's Employee, because the character that we're going to study was a very good example of one who excelled in the ministry of service. Remember I mentioned all five? Evangelism, education, fellowship, worship, service. The brother we're going to talk about was a brother who was really good in carrying out the service ministry. So we're going to do a character study, but a study of an individual who is very good in carrying out the ministry of service. And his name was, if you haven't guessed it, Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus. Now the New Testament has a kind of a performance review of the kind of service that he rendered to the church. So I want us to look at it and you know, keep an eye on our own performance to see if our service matches his service uh, because he's such a terrific role model. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about Epaphroditus, shall we? Now there's not a lot written about Epaphroditus. But what little there is tells us a lot about the kind of man that he was. His name, Epaphroditus, means handsome or lovely. There are only two direct references to him and both of them are in the book of Philippians. That's why I wanted you to open to that particular passage. Now these references do not say that he was a prophet. It doesn't mention that he could do miracles neither that he was a great soul winner or a preacher or a teacher, no, no discussion about him teaching or preaching, performing any miracles. But it does immortalize him by mentioning him in the New Testament, why? Because he was an effective servant. Now we read about him in Philippians chapter two, and just before we read the passage, I want to set up the scene a little bit here. The scene for this passage is as follows. Paul, the apostle, is imprisoned in Rome and the Philippian congregation selects Epaphroditus to bring Paul a gift of money for his needs while he is imprisoned in Rome. Um, Epaphroditus then falls ill while he is in Rome and um, the uh, brethren in Philippi begin to worry about him. And so Paul sends Epaphroditus back to them, to Philippi, and he brings them the precious epistle from which we will read chapter two in the book of Philippians. Let's look down at verse, uh, say, let's uh, down verse 25. So Paul says, but I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him and not on, uh, not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. And so the information is brief, but in it we see the qualifications necessary to actually be heaven's employee, as well as a great example of Christian service performed by this brother. So what would be the qualifications if you're going to be an employee of heaven, of which Epaphroditus was? Well, one of the qualifications is that Epaphroditus was very active in the church. You know, Paul refers to Epaphroditus as a brother, a fellow worker, and a fellow soldier. And these terms suggest a certain activity. 
For example, as a brother, Epaphroditus shared an emotional relationship with Paul and the brethren. He wasn't, a, it wasn't like a Sunday friendship. You know the Sunday friendships you have? You know, we all have. You know, we know people only from church because we only see them on Sunday. And then we're actually surprised if we bump into them at Walmart or some, that's what I call a Sunday friendship, but that's not what he had. He, he, he had an emotional commitment that could move Paul to call him not just a brother, but my brother and the rest of the church to be grieved by his illness. Paul also referred to him as a fellow worker and this describes their common labor. You know, Epaphroditus was a man who was busy doing things in order to establish and nourish and build up the church. He was one of the workers. We know who they are. You know the old story, you know, 90% of the church, 90% uh, of the work in the church done by about 10 or 12%. Now I can say, because I've got the stats, that here in Choctaw that's not necessarily true. A lot more than just 10% are working and serving. But I've been to congregations where that adage is true. 90% of the work actually done by 10% of the people. And so in Epaphroditus' case, we see that part of his service was delivering a gift to Paul in prison and then return with, um, with a letter. Now, if we read between the lines, we're actually going to see what kind of service this was, because all we see is, well, you know, he brought me a letter and that was his service, but think about it. Between Philippi and Rome, 700 miles. It wasn't just down the road, 700 miles between Philippi and Rome. What about his job? What about his family? What about the expenses? You know, how many people would inconvenience and sacrifice themselves in this way for the church? I mean, he really worked for the church. And what I'm trying to say is he wasn't an employee of the church. I'm saying what he did was real work. It cost him something. And then aside from a brother, aside from a fellow worker, Paul also calls him a fellow soldier. And this echoes their common stand as Christians in a hostile world. We say, you know, wow, this is this world, you know, going to hell in the handbasket, right? We say that all the, oh, the world is terrible. <laughs> but the world was really terrible in the first century for Christians. Really terrible. The world was being dominated by a vicious world power. Rome, you know, we, they make movies about it now and they kind of glamorize it, but there was nothing glamorous about the Roman Empire if you weren't at the top. If you were one of the slaves, if you were one of the conquered people, there was nothing glamorous about living under that type of oppressive uh, regime. And so the term you know, fellow soldier conjures up the imagery of struggles with all of the enemies of the faith. Enemies such as temptation or discouragement, Fatigue, you know, more people, more people uh, uh, become uh, uh, faithless, uh, fall away from Christ because of fatigue. It's not always about the loss of faith. Sometimes people are so dog tired from working that they, they, they lose their faith, that they become discouraged. Well, Epaphroditus was one of these, not that he lost his faith, but he worked so hard, sacrificed so much that he was at the end of his rope physically. The fact that Paul, as I say, refers to him as a fellow soldier tells us about Epaphroditus' spiritual life as one who was strong and faithful, steadfast and mature despite, despite the obstacles that he faced. Like Paul himself, they were fellow soldiers. He was like Paul. And you know, the Apostle Paul does not um, give fake flattery there's no empty flattery in his letters. When he rebukes somebody, he rebukes somebody. You, you know you've been rebuked. But when he compliments, you know that that compliment is sincere. It's not hollow, it's not puffery. He's really describing the character and the spirit of this man, Epaphroditus. You know, it's interesting to note that Epaphroditus was praised for his attentive service to the church, not just his attendance to church services. Can I repeat that? Just in case you weren't paying attention. 
Epaphroditus was praised for his attentive service to the church, not just his attendance to church services. You see, um, coming to church does not replace serving the church, okay? Our service to the church is not attending church services. A lot of people think that, that well, you know, I served the church, I was there Sunday, wasn't I? I came to church, didn't I? I fulfilled my duty, didn't I? I'm serving, I'm there, you know, every Sunday I can be there. That, we don't understand that, that's not church. That, you're being served. When, when you come to church, you're the one being served. The brethren who are distributing the communion are serving you. The, brethren, the, the sisters that are teaching your children, they're serving you. The preacher who gets up and, 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 and preaches the gospel, he's serving you. You're not serving the church. The church is serving you. Epaphroditus was qualified to be an employee of heaven, secondly, because he was submissive to the church. He was active in the church and he was submissive to the church. Now while this passage talks about what he did, most of the verses describe his role and consequently they reveal his attitude. He had two functions that we know of. His first function was as a messenger. Now he was called an apostle in the same way that Barnabas was an apostle in Acts chapter 14. He was a duly appointed messenger, a legate. Now, he wasn't one of the apostles. You know, there were 12 apostles of Jesus. They were the apostles because they were chosen by Jesus Himself with a special message and a special witness. But different churches, different congregations, you know, they selected their own legates, their own messengers or apostles or messengers. Today, what do we call them? Well, we call them missionaries. Today we call them missionaries. Who is a missionary? Uh, uh, Brother Elmera in, in Haiti, who is he? Well, he's a messenger from us to those people. Whenever a church supports a missionary to go to another place, you know, what, what are we doing? We're sending our messenger with the message of the gospel to that place. The church here supports uh, our uh, Bible talk. What, what, what is that? Well, we're the Bible talk is the messenger of the Church of Christ in Choctaw. To whom? Well, to the people who go to the internet. We're preaching to them. And so uh, Epaphroditus was one of these guys. He was a messenger. He was sent to another, to another place. He was a messenger for Antioch. Epaphroditus was a messenger for Philippi. And he, he, he was sent by the church with a gift for Paul. And then another role, he was a minister. He wasn't asked to preach or counsel. He was just asked to deliver a gift. He was basically a delivery boy, if you want to just boil it down. A delivery boy for the church. However, the depth of his sacrifice and his great commitment in carrying out his assignment raised this humble activity to the point of being a holy and an acceptable sacrifice. And this reveals his humble and submissive attitude. You know, think about it. The church said, we want you to go to Rome. And he replied and said, when do I leave? And then Paul said, I need your help. And he replied, what can I do to help you? God raised this inglorious and mundane task to an eternal level because the man who did it humbled himself and submitted to his leaders in carrying out their directions without hesitation, without complaint. You don't hear anywhere Epaphroditus saying, you got to be kidding, you want me to go to Rome? I'm going to have to take two weeks off of my job. I, you don't hear that. You don't see that. You know, think about the things that go on in our congregation. Serving in the nursery. Oh, it's hard to get people to serve in the nursery, why? Because it's hard, that's why. You're in there with little kids. I'll let that sink in for a while. How about delivering food to the poor? How much fun is that? 
getting an address, going to a place that may not be very, very nice, and a part of town that may not be very, very nice, and bringing food. How about cleaning the building? How about mowing the lawn when it's 105 degrees and doing it for free? And the only place your name appears is scratched on that piece of paper back there. You said July the 12th, you, you would do it. These are not glorious things. They're not things where people go, yeah, you were in the nursery. Yeah, we want to mention the people who are in the nursery because they did a great. But these things, as we see by Epaphroditus' example, these simple, humble things are lifted up to become glorious things, why? Because they're done in the name of Christ, that's why. And they're done in a way which is humble and quiet, without complaint, without seeking glory in any way. And so we look at Epaphroditus and we see he was active in the church and he was submissive to the church. We often say, well, we need to be in submission to our elders, our leaders, of course, Hebrews teaches us us that, but we also need to be in submission to the church and its needs. Very important. Maybe one more thing we can mention about Epaphroditus as we're kind of profiling him. Epaphroditus also had concern for the church. He was active in the church, submissive to the church, concerned for the church. Note that in verse 26 it says that he was ill, but his concern was not for himself, but that the church would be worried about him. That's what he was worried about. Communication in those days was slow. He was delayed in his return. He was sure that they would be anxious without news, and he agonized over their needless concern. Some of us are old enough to remember when all you had was a phone, and if you weren't close to a landline, you couldn't get in touch with anybody. And if your car broke down or something like that, you, know, you, you dropped out of sight. Well, it was even worse in, in those days. We see a man who really cared for the church. His pain would not cease until their pain on his behalf ceased, and they knew that he was okay. Paul says in Galatians 6.10, do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. Epaphroditus loved the church. It was a high priority in his life, and he loved it emotionally as well as physically and financially. The church has a great task in evangelizing and reaching out to the community um, in love, but it is to succeed in doing so um, uh, in other words, if it's going to succeed in doing so, it'll need people in the church that have the church as their number one priority in their lives. So hard, isn't it? Epaphroditus put the body of Christ above the love of this world and even above the love of his own body. You know, before we knew of his personal weakness and failures, John F. Kennedy managed to inspire a great desire to sacrifice for this country. And he has a quote, of course, uh, that he made in January 20 in 1961 uh, at his uh, inaugural address. We all know it. He said, and I, and I remember being in Canada, I was in high school, 1961, I was in high school. And I remember this from the news, they, they pulled that out of his address and even in Canada, we heard this eloquent thing that he said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Such a small verse, just a few words, but so packed with meaning and compassion and emotion. Well, I believe we've begun to see the church many times as something that God created to serve us rather than the vehicle that God created to enable us to serve Him and to serve the world and to serve one another. I believe we need to recapture the spirit of service exemplified 
by Epaphroditus. Now in Choctaw, this would mean, among other things, that each person in the congregation sincerely examine how they can be more active as Christians. Remember I said to you at the beginning, statistically, 90% of the church work is done by maybe 10%. That's not true here. And the reason I know that is when I look at the flow chart and the five areas of ministry and all the names of people who are responsible for ministries, that 10% that doesn't, you know, doesn't, you know, doesn't apply to us. We're like more 40%, 45, 50%. I'm saying that all of us should be involved in the service to the church. This is not a, a call tonight to sign up for more activities, but rather a call to live out your Christian faith in everything you do. When people are Christians 24 hours a day, you rarely have problems getting them to become involved in, quote, church activities. Christians who are Christians 24 hours a day are always involved in serving, always involved in helping others, and what is printed in the bulletin or announced at church becomes only like the tip of the iceberg of activities and services that are going on in the church. Ultimately, there's so much going on that you can't know it all or report it all, and that's what we're aiming for. I'm not worried that some brother or sister is doing a good work and somehow we don't know about it in the office or we're not allowed to record it or add it to the, I don't care if that happens. The only reason for the flow chart and organizational approach is just to help people get things started, to understand how to kind of become involved. But the goal is that there's so much going on, so much service, so much love being expressed one to another in a thousand different ways that no one can know it all except God. And He will reward. That's the goal. You know, in John 20, verse 30, it says, you know, uh, if everything that, that Jesus did was written in the book, you know, uh, no books could contain it all. Well, that's, I think, what we need to be aiming for. There's so much going on here at Shock that we can't record it all. We can't even get it all in on that chart. We can't even fit it all in on the calendar. There's so many good deeds that are taking place. I think that's one great moment of joy for preachers and elders and so on and so forth is when they hear about a great thing that is being done on behalf of one member by another member with no fanfare, no organization, nothing in the bulletin, whatever. It's just the right and good and loving thing to do and that person saw that something needed to be done and they're doing it, period. And I know there are many, many people in this congregation uh, that operate in that way. And uh, certainly, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I speak on behalf of the elders and, and everyone who you know, make a, their living preaching and ministering. Uh, we commend you. That's exactly what we should be doing, exactly what we're, what we're shooting for. And secondly, what we should be shooting for is serving like Epaphroditus means that we support and follow the leadership of the church. You know, this has been uh, relatively easy so far because we haven't done anything very difficult or dynamic. We haven't really been challenged yet, really. You know, we've been taking care of ourselves and we've been taking care of those we know and those we love, and that's good. And we've been going at it so it doesn't hurt too much. It isn't too risky. And we've spent most of our energy just going from our houses to the church building and back. That's fine. But I'm telling you, one of these days, one of these days we'll have some changes to make which will require more than just, change, uh, more than just figuring out which room I'm going to go to for class. We're going to get challenges that ask us to do more than just, hmm, do I go to the auditorium class or do I go to the fellowship hall class, or do I go to the S3 class? Well, that's my big challenge for this quarter. I think the time is coming when our congregation will be challenged for more. We need to remember Epaphroditus and his willingness to do what his leaders asked without grumbling, without criticizing, without complaining, without quitting. And then for Choctaw, 
heavenly service means that not just the elders care, not just the deacons care, not just the preachers care, but everybody cares about this congregation and what happens to it. You know what, I, I, the thing I hate hearing is when somebody says to me in their, in their conversation, they refer to the church as your church, or they refer to the church as this church, or the Choctaw church. They're talking about our congregation. Would you talk about your wife like that, or your husband in the third person, or your child? Would you say, oh, that child? You wouldn't say that child or that grandchild. Why do we do that? This is our church. It belongs to us. My church, my congregation. I have ownership. I'm invested. When it goes great, I'm invested and I go great. When something bad happens, I'm invested and I feel bad too. You can tell if people really care about the church. You can tell by how well the grounds look. You can tell by the condition and the look of the building that they meet in. You can tell by how people treat each other and those who minister to them. You can tell by how people treat strangers who come here searching for God and His love. Do we leave them just talking to themselves? You know, each one of the things that I mentioned requires the caring of each person here in order for the picture of a caring church to come through. Just a few people who care cannot create the image of a caring church. You, you, you can't print a welcome packet that says we care and think that that is going to prove to the person who walked through the door that we care. We don't care enough here until everybody cares. That's our problem, if we have one. Till everybody cares. In order for our property and our ministries and our worship and our fellowship to look like they are cared for, everybody has to care. Not just the people who are paid to care or who have been appointed to care. Everybody's got to care. And so, if God were reviewing your job performance, would you keep your heavenly employment? Or could God use you as the model in Philippians? Could a preacher 50 years from now or 100 years from now say, I want to preach to you a sermon about heaven's employee and I want to use uh, Pete Beller, or I want to use uh, Gail Morgan, or uh, you know, I, I'm going to use that person as my example of someone who was active in the church, someone who was submissive to the church, someone who cared for the church. Could your name be put there instead of Epaphroditus? Could you stick your name in there and say that? So if you need to make a change, it's not just the, quote, the evening service. People say, well, I love the evening service. It's laid back, it's relaxed, you know. Only the guy who's preaching is wearing a tie, and even then. Brothers and sisters, it's the 5 p.m. service, but still the gospel we're preaching to you. There's still God's word that's being opened to you. And the invitation is still being offered to you, whether you're only 50 or 5,000, the invitation is being offered to you by the Holy Spirit through my mouth. It's the same thing. So if you need to care more, get into it more, whatever, whatever you need to help you move forward, whether that is to repent, to be restored, maybe you haven't been baptized, maybe you're just feeling lazy. Whatever that is, our elders are here to pray for you, and the brethren are here to support you and encourage you, and the ministers are here to help you become integrated and active in your church, my church. If you need to make a response, then we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.